Good evening, ladies and a few gentlemen, but thank you very much for being here. It's, an, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to be partaking in this evening. I um, want to first of all thank you for that introduction about all the degrees and whatnot, but the main star is sitting right here. Shelley, I am very excited about our interaction today because not only have you been writing for a while, you've also been a person who has you know, been in the media, you've tried to raise a platform for women's issues. So first, I just want a bit of a ground check with you. Sri the People and also your other sort of ventures right now. How is it going in terms of communicating about women's issues and having a voice? Thank you very much, Fatima. And thanks very much, everyone, for coming out here. Um, I'll, I'll use a strategy that I've learned from men. Always throw out statistics and numbers, so let's start, right? Uh, well, she the People, uh, as the website alone and its social network, now has 20 million eyeballs a month. Uh, when I started out, they said you wouldn't get one because this was a hobby. And so I think that I'm really excited with the possibilities of sharing numbers like, you know, 1.2 million on Instagram, 3.2 million in a community. Thank you for showing up partly here. Um, you know, 20 million eyeballs, nearly a million on YouTube. Whatever numbers you want, I have them. Because I always say that, you know what, we're still, with all those fab numbers, just 2% of Indian urban women. And where are the rest, right? They're all on their way to get onto Sheet People. Yeah, so I think that I would use. Okay, so just while we're talking about statistics and numbers, um, let me start with my favorite title in your book. Bichari, badass or bitch? Okay, first of all, I want a quick show of hands as to what you think uh, all of us are here. Okay, <laughs> no, really seriously. You know, I just want to get right into some of the aspects that you've highlighted in this book. And I'll tell you the struggle that I had with the book was that you cover so many topics. And there's so much conversation that has to be had. I felt like there are chapters that have to be written, books that have to be written about the chapters. And I'm sure as an author, you must have also felt that frustration in some way. But tell me about this whole, you know, bichari, badass, or bitch, because if it was up to me, I would be all of the above. I think all of us are all of the above. <laughs> and we should be, right? Um, and you know, one of the reasons, and you know, you said this, that um, I really didn't know where to stop when I was writing all of these chapters because there is just so much to say. And there are so many stories to share. But I think the way, um, you know, Fatima picked this up, and this is really the triptych of our lives, right? We are always slotted. And that's nearly the minute you meet a woman for the first time, somebody slots her. Oh, she's that type. Oh, she looks like the single woman type. She looks like the divorcee type. She looks like she doesn't have a life type. She looks like the sari type, the jhol type. I mean, you just name her, there's a type. I just don't know the types of men around me. And I am just really, you know, sort of, when, when I wrote this chapter, one of the biggest questions to me was like, Sabkile, there is a slot. And you know, there is a slot that is decided by everybody before she has opened her mouth, shared who she is. We don't know her resume, we don't know her story, we don't know her backstory. So I think that was one of the things that was so uniform. Among, from Sushmita Sen to Shelley, you just think of any story. And this was exactly the truth. Every woman had a story like this, no matter how successful she was. I mean, you know, it's an example that I just about got into the book because Sushmita Sen tweeted about yeah, us the day recent. this incident happened. What incident? I mean, really, her lover went on stage and said literally on social stage that, you know what, I'm dating her. And everybody went after her, gold digger, gold digger, gold digger. And then, you know, we did a piece about her saying, listen, gold digger? I mean, she knows her rocks, right? <laughs> she knows what's... Yeah, but Shelly, what about being the prime minister of a country and uh, having a dance party at home and... Um, oh, totally. Oh, yeah. You know, Listen, I'm I mean, <laughs> I really wanted to dance from that corridor from my own poster all the way here saying all for Sana Marin, right? Yeah, it was an apology that came out. Yes. We're talking about the Finnish uh, incident. That's you know, and played. I really think that this apology is the symptom of our system. We today have to apologize for partying. I mean, just for a minute, have we all thought of like, we have a life and our life is beyond our boardrooms. And this isn't even about setting an example because partying is not about taking away an example. You know, you're not doing something that seems to perhaps question something that may have, let's say, moral borderlines. I really don't think there's anything immoral about partying. We're just not used to 
as a people, as a population, whether it's India or anywhere in the world, we don't like the idea of a woman having fun, right? right. So before I got in here, I was just messaging my husband. I said, by the way, I'm spending an hour having a drink by myself because I just want to get into the groove, right? So I went in, had a drink, and then it, this became a Delhi standard time. I said, okay, let me have another drink. And I said, I'm going to just have a great time, right? And at this point, you're just looking at all of those Instagram reels. And this is why I feel that our community has gone from one to one million. Because you know what? Women are chilling. And we're normalizing that. Let's do that. So normalizing is the word that I want to sort of mention a lot. There's a lot of the topics that you talk about which need normalizing. And, and I must uh, thank you for also normalizing orgasms in the middle of everything. I'm trying but, uh, to. Yeah, but we'll get into that later. But in all seriousness, what is going on? Because we have been talking about gender equality for a very long time. We've been talking about the, the obvious, which is including women in the economy. The, you know, the kind of... Uh, push that can give to GDP and of course, I mean, you can see every single UN development report around that, you know, but what is happening? What is happening? Is it women who are also not really understanding how to communicate towards each other? You've talked about patriarchal s systems. You've talked about, you know, lending being an issue. Credit is a huge issue. I was very surprised. In fact, one of our, I don't know if she was a fellow colleague of yours also, yeah. Anuva Bhosle. Yeah. One of the top uh, journalists in this country struggled to get a loan. Can you imagine? This is Anuva Bhosle because she is. Tell, tell everybody because the she's, story. She's single and they wanted either her brother or her husband to come there and, you know, they didn't want to sanction that loan, even though she had enough assets of her own. They needed a man to give her the loan. Right. And it just was absurd. I mean, like. But listen, one, one second. Forget it's absurd. This is one, a person who is very sort of out there. I mean, yeah. look, if Aruba Bhosle is struggling for this. Tell me something, you as an entrepreneur also, what, if, what has your experience been on the ground in terms of being able to raise funds, in terms of you know, creating a women's platform? What is the point of this book? Okay, so let me start with a couple of things that you said in terms of numbers, right? What are the numbers telling us about where are women? What is happening with equality? So again, the reason I throw these numbers is because these numbers stick to our heads, right? We're talking about a $5 trillion economy. And we're saying 50% of our population will take us there. How does that even make sense? 50% of our population will make sure that we'll head to a $5 trillion economy. It cannot happen. And the reason it cannot happen is because you're essentially saying that I am going to work on half capacity. To, to which logical human being does that make sense? One of the reasons why I wrote this book very differently from an economist lens while using those numbers was to say, we'll keep throwing numbers at how many women are dwindling off the workforce, how many of them are potentially going to change the way our economic structures are, how many will add to the GDP, is because what we're forgetting is that all this opportunity that we dance about is completely dependent on the environment we raise our women. And we don't just raise them at, as mothers or mother-in-laws and whatever else in our workplaces, the rights on the streets and the rights on the sheets. You look at any angle, there is a huge paucity of understand what women need. Great example, and some of you are gonna have a great laugh at this. So my next venture is about looking at how women can have better sexual and gynecological health, essentially helping them get better orgasms. Somebody turns around and tells me, you know what, this sounds like this venture I've recently funded $20 million in. I said, tell me more about that venture. And Pat it comes. It's just helping men get better erections. What? I said, how is my business model different? Put $20 million right now, right? But it doesn't occur to them that this is something that women seek. Why? Because we don't talk. This makes people uncomfortable. And it makes people as uncomfortable as talking about, Mera paisa kidare? Where is my money? Not the money that my uncle, my dad, my husband, my brother wants to give me so I can have money in my pocket, but where is my money? my own money. So it's really ironic to me that sometimes money, sexual conversations are just as uncomfortable. Wow. I mean, you know, this is what needs to change. And that's what sisterhood economy is all about, saying that we keep talking about the size of the opportunity, right? the next big frontier in the GDP. Huh. But we don't talk about these things. We change this and economics will fix itself. Okay, one minute, one minute, one minute. I'm going to page 228. 20. One of my favorite parts. No, no, you don't okay, have to. Okay, I, bet, I, I think you've seen it. Yeah, yeah, I think you've gone over okay, this. Okay, yeah, book. fair enough. <laughs> All right. 
A woman in our society is never left free of criticism for whatever she does. If she expects money from men, she is shamed as a gold digger. Yeah. But if she wants to earn her own money, she is labeled as an unsanskari. Is that unsanskari? That's right. Okay, sorry. Rude woman who wants to shame her husband for not being able to provide her with financial support. You mentioned the whole Sushmita yeah. episode. But before yeah. that, you say something that's very important. Financial freedom isn't about having money, it's about having your own money. So dads, brothers, father-in-laws and husbands don't say, take as much as you want from me. Yeah, so? You know, so, so that is the point, right? And I remember that this, this, this happened before I wrote the book. I did this as a tweet. And it really got picked up and I realized that people do recognize that there is a very big difference in having that money. It's a bit like having an edu education through an MBA school that you did and you have this fantastic degree, but you never put it to use. You never got a job leveraging that degree, right? I think it's literally that. For a lot of us, and a lot of the women that I've spoken to, I've spoken to I think just about 500 to 800 women other than the ones that we've sort of covered in She the People, Girl Talk and various spaces. This is fundamentally the issue. We don't believe that women have a space of their own, a right of their own in many spaces. And that's why I think this is probably the only discussion I'm doing with a woman. At every single other event, there's a man in that chair. <laughs> I'm like, get in there and ask Listen, me there questions. Is, there is a man the in book. this chair, okay? Huh? There is a man in this chair as well. Fatima, <laughs> this is what I don't want you to say. I you know, I don't want to rile you up. Yeah, you know? yeah, totally. I don't want you to say that because that's a woman who knows her shit. Yeah, and earns her own money and asks her whatever she wants. But th th this is part of the point. And, and the reason why I keep saying this is that it's not to talk about um, women's issues to just the ones who are converted. It's about making people more uncomfortable. So a, a friend of mine ordered the book. And you know what he said on the call? I have given this book to the most empowered woman in my company. I said, wrong call. Mm. Take it to the most disempowered man and hand it over to him. Because it makes no sense giving this book to somebody who already understands her problems. Give it to somebody who will sort of figure out a bit like a Mills and Boone and Sinley Sheldon's when we needed them and we didn't know where to go to for all those answers. Oh, oh. They're all in here. Actually, listen, by the way, speaking of uh, empowering women, uh, we've both come from this environment uh, where we've been surrounded by women. And there's this whole lovely, what is that term again? Boss girl, right? Boss yeah. girl or something like that. Boss something, whatever, something. What is the reality with boss ladies that you've encountered in competitive um, environments such as the media? <laughs> okay, so it's a loaded question, but I'll flip it around before I answer the media. Media is a different beast and we can all see it. Did and I don't want to get into a debate shame. about media and then it'll yeah. just sort of become another subject. No, but I'm talking about boss ladies and how, what are they doing? in their positions and what is, seriously, what's your opinion on how that's going versus so, tokenism? I mean, there's certain things I want to talk about here. Sure, fair enough, but I think that the easier, um, the easier blame is to pick the boss lady mm. because it's so much harder to blame the boss man, right? So a story that I did a few years ago on, I mean, I, I, I was interviewed by somebody and it's very much articulated here is that when I joined one of the channels back in 2009, you know, within two hours of my sitting on my desk, my editor, then editor, came up um, and said, you know what, yeah, we'll put your face on our new channel, but don't think you're going to be the managing editor. And I'm thinking, this is 2008, how do I answer this question? I wasn't sure, new job, poached their etc. to build their channel. And I, told, I just turned around and tell them, you know what, I don't want your cabin, you go sit there. It's my face on the television and I'll be a CEO someday. And I don't think he knew what hit him and I didn't know how I had the guts to say what I did. I nearly went to HR after that because I was feeling nervous. You know, the guilt of having said it and it literally left my mouth. But today I'm thinking about it and it really made a big difference to what I did. It was like a moment of courage and I didn't think I had it in me. And it was a moment of private courage because nobody knew it and thank God for it at that point. Right? He was like, oh, I hope nobody heard that, right? But this is what I'm saying. This is how easily we blame boss ladies. Boss ladies are like other women. You know, this, this whole conversation of writing a book like Sisterhood Economy is not a shame men. It's no, just- nothing to do with that. Yeah, and it has nothing to do with saying this is what men do. I'm saying this is what women don't have which is not like saying this is what men are causing for women not to have. The second part of it is that we're all dealing with a system which is fed with patriarchy. So which is why this book is really unique in a very strange way. It actually blames mothers. 
and says there is a concept called bad moms. We're always talking about the bad mother-in-law. And it turns that bad mother-in-law issue around to say, the mother-in-laws traditionally considered bad could actually be a very big ally in how women become economically free. So there is a Tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, so let's look at that, right? Like we, we all have situations where we are raised to believe that mother-in-law is the other house. Once you know, once you get there, you'll know what happens. But who's telling this to the daughter? It's a mom. Why is she saying this? Her mother-in-law did this to her. Why is the mother-in-law doing this? Because her mother did it to her. So the cycle is really vicious, right? And there is constantly a mother, a mother-in-law to blame. And I keep saying in this book to the mothers, don't raise gharelu daughters. Gharelu. Don't send them to London School of Business and say, ab shadi kar lo, ho But this is happening, huh? And I mean, at the same time, it keep in mind, huge. we're talking about a privileged lot. I mean, we're talking 100%. about a privileged lot that you're yeah. talking about. It is. It is a huge so problem. degree is a nice time pass for uh, at LSE and coming back with your master's and all is for, for delaying marriage. 100%. Great point. So, there are three women in my organization today who are in their PhDs, not because they love PhDs. Perfect way to push marriage. Parents are at their case since graduation. What do we do? We can't get married. We don't want to get married. What do we do? Okay, we'll become fatter turkeys. At least by that time, we will try and find a guy. Otherwise, Papa and Mama, you know, will be a PhD girl, perfect for IS officer. This is this is a real story. And I see this in my own colleagues because they're like, I don't want to get married. But what do I do? My parents wouldn't let me stay out, so I'll do a PhD. Unko lagega padhai ho rahi hai. Aur aane wale sambandhis ko lagega ki achhi ghar ki padhi likhi ladki hai. Achha. That's how it is. Achha. I mean, there's no, there's no difference between a young girl who's perhaps from a very basic household trying to do this in the Jawaharlal Nehru University versus a girl in Sobo in South Bombay, who has actually done this, but eventually had to come up and say, listen, we are a household, the marriage has to happen at 22. That's pretty straight. So that is happening, and of course yeah. you uh, just mentioned, uh, I, I mean, I don't mean to put you on the spot on this, but you've seen this even within a platform such as yourself. You've had bright girls who've of been course. quitting, yeah. because ho gaya ab, you know, now, ha, you but know. But khud nahi bol rahe wo, khud nahi bol rahe. Parents it's pressure parents that are putting the pressure in. Yeah. So this is where we get into something, I think, which sort of summarizes what the conclusion of one of these issues is, is that you say, we need to put a new triptych in place, awareness, access, and availability of opportunity, no matter what age or how they identify themselves, yeah. okay? Tell me how tech is going to help in that. In a very big way. And I think a lot of women who are here, I've seen them emerge in technology. I mean, friends who have otherwise perhaps had very different journeys have totally bloomed when we saw them online building communities. I mean, look at Smriti, who's building Gurgaon, uh, Gur, you know, the Gurgaon Community Circle, or Parul, who headed uh, you know, My City for Kids. Many of you who are here, who've actually literally sort of spun the whole idea of what technology does to your personalities, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, look, look at Rupi. Rupi is a great classical musician <laughs> and teacher, but she teaches kids online three years. She uh, taught my son. And I feel like they're all powering their lives through the power of technology. There are two very fundamental factors. One is that it gives you the ability to do what you want from where you are. Through the bottomless pit of your circumstances, you can at least access some form of the internet, right? I mean, perhaps all of these people here can do that on feature phones and fancy phones. There are a lot of people who may just use that SMS technology or a chat bot like the one we've created called Dr. Didi, where you can ask any question and the chat bot will answer your questions without judging you, right? If you don't know what's the difference between your vagina and valva, you're like, oh, kaha jaye, pooch ye sawal. <laughs> chat bot, ke, I'm not judging you, pooch lo, no, it's like se, People I'll asking questions about their vaginas or to chat box? What did you say? Okay, yeah. all right. Because okay. the chat box is technology. Not it's calling not it shame, shame. Or calling you shame. <laughs> yeah. So th there are these things, right? So, so the bottom line is that technology, I mean, this is just an extreme example of complete lack of information. And you will see this being the next big frontier. And I'm very much a part of this on women's health. But ah. look at just the basics of technology. It lets you meet a sisterhood. I have not met Smriti before in person, like, you know, until the first time we met, because we met online. And I know what she does, and I know how she changes my life. Bhavna, who's sitting here, used to work with us for three years before I first met her in Flesh and Blood. Mm. 
But there is a sisterhood and it's ground up. And it's happening because technology is allowing us to make that happen. Those WhatsApp groups that were like, oh, I'm not on that WhatsApp group. We're all on it. We're loving it. We really like the idea of connecting with somebody else who's changing it for us, right? Jitne bhi forwards aate hai na, if you read 2% of them, there's a small sliver out there that makes you feel better about your day. It works. Can, can we sort of actually on some level say that, you know, this is not a conversation and, and I think uh, e even your platform doesn't, it's not just women, women, women. I'll tell you something, I'll make a confession. There is, and, and I know I'll, I'm going to develop more enemies uh, tonight for saying this, if it's possible. Um, I don't like Women's Day, okay? I don't like Women's Day. And I'm a person who started a show on Bloomberg called Women Mean Business. And when I first started that show, it was about, you know, they said, oh, you know, uh, oh, are we going to be showing work-life balance and how somebody stays fit and yeah. they actually... And I said, no, actually, if we're talking to the CEO of Capgemini, we're going to talk about how you run Capgemini. Yeah. If we're talking to a porn star, we're going to talk about, you know, the uh, sort of production rights, you know, all that stuff. So there's a lot of stereotypical imagery around women in careers. Yeah. Tell me what you think of the fact that we actually maybe need to start talking about respecting ability rather than gender. 100%. Yeah. I think the premise of why She the People came into the world was precisely this. We're speaking to female mathematicians not because they're female, because they're mathematicians. Yes. But we're also speaking to them because nobody else is going to talk to you and give you the attention you need. Great example here, Esther Duflo won the Nobel Prize, along with Abhijit Banerjee and the third person, uh, Ma Kramer. The point is that when we made the announcement, this is, by the way, Economic Times front page, mm. Abhijit Banerjee and his wife have won the Nobel Prize. Mm. Forget mentioning the third person, but you called her his wife? Yeah. You know, I mean, how do you do that? This happened with Mary Curie all the way back. The first woman to have got the Nobel Prize was her, but she shared it with her husband. Then she's the only woman to have got it twice. And the second time she got it by herself. But we're not making these distinctions, right? And they're not happening. Even now when you'll see the stats on every single award that's around us, you will see there's a huge gap on how many women get it. And it's not because they're not deserving. We just don't know how to identify them. We don't have the bone in us to go and fetch where these women are. And that's precisely the reason when, when She the People was born and wh when this book is and the various conversations we have, we just don't see the other side. So yeah. that's taking me back to the question that I just asked, which, which is, is respecting ability. Huh. Ability, ability, ability. And I just want to know how one can really sort of really push that forward. How is that going to happen, actually? Because, see, you're a person, you've, uh, you know, part of the reasons we're not getting to statistics and uh, economics is because you do know that she knows her numbers and yeah. she has uh, <laughs> spent a little bit of time telling us about the stock markets. So, we want, you know, it's not some flaky yeah, conversation. So, we're not going to bore you with that. But my main question to you is, what is it going to take now? Because here we've had opportunities to both technology and also COVID on one hand. Yeah. Let's look at it as an opportunity yes. of what all we've seen. Yeah. Let's give it a push, okay? Next three years, what would be your utopian uh, sort of... No, I think the next 30, 30 minutes, though, I would say that every woman who's here should carry a copy of this book for the man in the house. Because one of the big ways by which we can exact change is to never think that a woman's book or a book written by a female author about women's issues belongs just to women. Right? You and I are going to read this and say, oh, yeah, bang on, bang on. But who needs to read this? The ones who want to help your environment get better. And this is not to say that the guys don't know what's happening in your lives. Maybe they just get another reinforcement of what they need to fix. And that's, that's another example of what I've written here. About four years ago when I returned from Stanford after a fellowship, you know, one of my professors called me to speak to South Asian um, law students in, in Bombay. And I looked at that room and swear to God, these were people from Bangladesh, Nepal, you know, India, Afghanistan, Pakistan. There was not one woman. And I was a little nervous. And I said, what am I going to tell these people? Like, what am I going to say? And I literally said this. I said, part of the reason that there is a ground up revolution of women getting together is that we are reaching a point where now we need the men to start getting together and helping us make this much faster than it is. And precisely why we all need to have that conversation more openly with our brothers, sisters, I mean brothers, men, husbands, partners, just colleagues, 
and, and make it work. Because that is really, according to me, the real piece of the sisterhood working for itself. You said, what's next in three years? Honestly, I really don't know if we can change a lot in three years. I mean, let's years. remove yeah. ourselves even from the yeah. realities of the, of, the, of the economy at the moment. Okay, okay let's... No, 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 no,
excellent content up on the big screen and pass the damn message down. Like, just do it, somebody. Do it for us. But is it going to happen? I mean, I saw some of the things that you mentioned, and I, in fact, I'm going to be opening the floor to uh, the wonderful audience here in a minute. But, you know, you've talked about this wonderful concept, which is uh, monetizing, or I guess getting value for d work housework. that's housework. housework. Yeah. I mean, to me, that sounds like a fantasy in science fiction, you it know. Is. Huh. So then? It is a fantasy in science fiction, but I think the conversation is very important. And perhaps COVID helped us a little bit. It was so nice to see all these men on Instagram washing their dishes. <laughs> so nice to see. What a good break, right? Like all the brooms and suddenly the brooms got sexier. Everything looks so good. But the truth is, I thought it was a great window of opportunity for them to see this. I know that a lot of men have gone back. But I think it makes a huge difference. One of the stories I tell there, and I'm not sure my mother's going to like this, but I do mention in this that when my parents came home to my house in Bombay, they were really uncomfortable. I was sitting there having a drink, chilling with them, and my husband was making the biryani. They were like, how do you even do this? Like, you're married twice? Second marriage also, you're letting the guy be in the kitchen? Who does that? I'm like, if somebody enjoys making good food, and somebody enjoys having a drink, let's let everybody be, right? <laughs> and I feel really bad for the men. They can't do this stuff without getting stigmatized. That's even more awful. Imagine like somebody who in a house who loves cleaning spick and span bathrooms. Or like, you know, my sister says this after two drinks. I cannot clean the kitchen after two drinks. Somebody else should do this. She's like, make me do anything before that, but why should I go after that, right? I want to just chill. And I'm like, absolutely. Like, let people be, let them live the life. What, the, what, what do the Americans say? I'm living the dream. Right. Let's do that, right? And let's, let's be fair to the guys who love no, doing that. You're not being a feminist. You're not being a bra burner. No, you're not I'm being, being a feminist. And I think those men who deserve us on their side right. when they're doing this deserve us feminists too. So one second, just one second while I'm talking about, I mean, I really want to, I mean, I was just joking about the feminism part. I think this, these are conversations that have to be had. But um, just as I conclude and I leave it to the floor in a minute, Charlie, first of all, congratulations on Thank this book. Um, what was the hardest chapter that you had to write oh, in definitely. it? Oh, definitely. Come on, yeah, tell yeah. me. No, no, I, okay, so look, um, we, we all will diss it here, and I'm saying this with great confidence, but the hardest chapter for me to write really were two. One was this chapter called the Beauty Parlor Economics, which, by the way, this morning, thanks to some guy who is a startup founder, funded with $5 million, went viral because he thought this was great PR for him. So on LinkedIn, he picked up this chapter which, where I essentially articulate why the massage lady who comes home is actually a feminist in disguise. She's really running her household, but she's not getting counted for enough in the economy because we don't think her job is good enough to be called employment. So um, somebody who runs uh, you know, a parlor training <laughs> picked it up today and plastered it on LinkedIn saying, this is the next big frontier for women. When women are doing things such as carrying a suitcase to your house to give you a home spa, they're actually creating an economic opportunity that's not getting counted properly. The only time they get counted is when they buy products in, in the store, not when they earn because it never goes into the, into the system, right? So that's one, and I really urge everyone to read it because you'll really relate to what beauty parlor economics is. And there's a beautiful element to it which is not economic in nature but has supreme economic impact. The ability of these women to get out of the house, meet a bunch of other people going through similar situations, have that conversation and get the courage to continue to work and earn money. We don't think about the courage that it takes to get out and the sisterhood it gives you to say, I'm going to stay at it. You know, there's a, there's a really moving story of a lady that used to work with my mother when I was in class five. She lost her entire family of grown-ups, including her husband, I think, to a boat capsize. And I used to see her every day at that store, selling to people. She was working at Santushti, I remember. She probably still is there. Just finding a purpose in life, right? I don't know if she needed money at that point. It wasn't something that occurred to me, but she went every single day. And she ran that store till the last time I went there, I remember that story. The second tough chapter was definitely the big O. 
that if we want equality on the streets, why are we so shy to ask for it in the sheets? And it makes people uncomfortable, but it's high time people get it's uncomfortable. It's interesting that you throw that into the mix in the middle of economics and, 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 and... Because, you know what, okay. It's a very simple equation. Happier people happen through happy, healthy lives. They also happen through happy, healthy sex lives. If you're gonna land up at your office completely <laughs> irritated because you had a fricked up night, it's gonna have an impact. We ran a survey because nobody else had done this survey before. At She The People, we asked on Instagram, how do you feel about this connection? And we spoke to six gynecologists, all of them had the same answer. Mm. If you have a happy, healthy life, and if you're pleased with your sex life, you are gonna have a much happier approach to life, which has economic consequences. So I don't think I need to get into further details. You yeah. can figure this out on your own. Right. And certainly read the chapter because it's gonna make you crack up. I just couldn't believe that we don't talk about this. You By know? the way, I learned that there's this platform called Oh My Rithik. Oh My Rithik, yeah. Okay. <laughs> By the way, you have to read this book. There's so many interesting things that come out of it. Anyway, we'll get into yeah, that all yeah, that later. But um, I could go on and on with uh, this lady over here. I just want to thank you for thank you. Uh, this opportunity to talk to you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Shelly Chopra. Thank you. Sisterhood, 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 sisterhood economy of buy for women. And uh, without due delay, I just first of all want to thank our patient audience uh, for having listened to us and yeah. our banter. And, and, and enjoyed the drinks and come for this. Fantastic. Helps, I right? hope you've done that. And I shall now open up the floor to Q&A from, uh, from the audience. Please just announce your name, who you are, and address oh, your question. Ask the guy. Yeah, I love him. I like him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Hi, Shelly. Great talk. Thank you so much. Uh, my wife and I were featured on your platform a few weeks ago. Um, we got 5 million views through that on Instagram, so thank you so much. Uh, I have a quick... Those who haven't seen it, go and see it. Sorry? I said those who haven't seen the video, please go now. Yes, please. <laughs> um, quick question for you. So you mentioned bichari, badass or bitch. Um, I want to ask who's helping men get out of the triangle of um, mama's boy, pussy wept or asshole? Because yeah, you're right. If I, if I, if I make a good, uh, uh, if I consult my wife while making a life decision, yeah. I'm pussy whipped. If I do something for my parents, I'm a mama's boy. And if I do something for myself, I'm an asshole. Yeah. So, I'm, who's, you know, who, who's I, empowering men? Because we are, we're equally yeah. victims of patriarchy as, as much as women. That's right. I just want to say four words. I know the feeling. <laughs> I am going through this day in, day out, and I really recognize where you are. The challenge, I'll tell you, is that what you're going through is an issue that needs to be addressed. But you know, this is how I put it. And this is for men who are in that situation, for the women who are, or many other genders who continue to face this minority bias on such issues, is the fact that when people are having these conversations about normalizing, men crying, you know, men taking their wife's side or taking their own side or any other side, we're saying precisely the same thing. We're, we are not having an argument about women versus men. It's men and women versus the system that is making them really uncomfortable. And precisely why I need more men to stand up and say what you are and ask those questions, because a large part of this book talks about how we are putting pressure on men to be the bread earners. We don't want to do that. Right. The challenge is that system requires men to be the bread earners and says women should not. To me, the idea, and this is a great point to introduce another story of my colleagues. So this is, you know, when I say things about my colleagues, it's because she, the people, is a product of who are ex our collective experiences. So there's this guy from a Sindhi household. And his entire family is constantly screening Sindhi women to get married because that's how it works among the Sindhis in that particular you know, area that he lives in. And he's okay getting married to another Sindhi. He says, six women I have shortlisted in the last two years. Each one of them said, I don't want to work. He said, I need double income, boss. He said, there's no way that I can get married and not have somebody who's going to earn her share. So what you're suggesting is happening to a lot of men who say, Listen, now I'm going to also turn around and say, dude, please earn your own money as well because I don't want to be the bread earner alone. Right. Because it is a difficult task. So I totally hear you, but it's a very important point 
and the reason why I say I hear you is at this moment, the numbers are skewed and the number of women who are going through this is huge, is huge. Like I said, we are getting labeled. Our life is just full of labels of all kinds and we're fighting that battle every single day because that is actually not just a battle about others. It kills your confidence and builds your self-doubt, which is what's happening for sure. So thank you for asking that question. That's a very good question, by the way. Loved it. Yes. Absolutely. Please continue. Would anyone else like to ask any questions? Yes, of course. I, is someone handling the mic? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. No, I'll just mention a celebrity I'm sure you already know. But she doesn't want to be known as that celebrity. She, she's worked very hard to create a new identity for herself. Gwyneth Paltrow mm. and Goop. Yeah. And the kind of, uh, you know, uh, arguments she has put forth, you know, uh, she said, at the end of the day, she said, it's all about being able to ask. If you don't ask, it will never be given, you know? Yeah. And of course, she's got her whole, you know, wellness and her products and so on and so forth. And she epitomizes, uh, you know, a certain level of liber being liberated. But at the same time, the things she does on a daily basis, if you follow her, her, her YouTube and everything, it's just... The ability to be yourself. She, she's worked extra hard to actually uh, dis dispose of that celebrity angle and really connect with her audience like this new person who wants to convey that, look, if I can do it, you can do it. You know? Yeah. So, uh, but you know, even if she used her celebrity piece, yeah. I would just commend her for doing that. Because yeah, I think course. you've got to just try and use that whatever best position you are in. That is by default. To create the next yeah, that's uh, by default. opportunity. But what comes through is that, of course, she's faced the same situations, even in her. You know, she had to raise money. She yeah. had to go through uh, a, a lot of failures. She had to sit with investors. She had to yeah. do a lot. She shared But you know, that. there's a lesson I take from what you say. And I'll say this for all of us. And I remember, you know, I mean, I've, people like, for example, once I remember the story of Zia Modi who told me, I don't get up at 4 a.m. and roll chapatis for my children. I don't need that trophy, right? <laughs> at 4 in the morning, I know exactly what she's doing. She's holding a meeting in the coffee shop at Four Seasons, getting those guys to work for her on investment banking. That's one way of looking at life. Another way of saying is that, that does Gwyneth Paltrow or anyone in her position, she doesn't necessarily, according to me, need to prove a point to have to go through that. And I would say that to every girl here, every woman here. Please don't try and say, I will go through the trenches before I come up. If somebody's gone through the trenches, please learn from my lessons and don't go through that trench. There is no need to do that. Because we are so conditioned to say, what's that, bhugatna hai, you know? We have to go through the damn thing. Don't go through it. Because somebody else has. And we, I think, the guys do this really well. Their watering hole and smoking calls and all of these are so good because they're right there saying, boss, I've done this stupidity. Just don't even go there, right? Okay. I think we need to fix so Taking that. ownership and, and sort of being more aggressive about taking it, communicating. Taking ownership and just learning from other people's lessons. And you don't have to kill yourself. You shouldn't. Yeah. Oh, Why good, should you? Good, Somebody's nice. done the dirty job, just learn the best and move to the next, next stage, right? Why do you want to reinvent the wheel? Yeah, yeah. I like that answer. I really like that answer. More questions? Anyone else? Please go ahead. Can, I think we need the mic over here. Shelly, thank you. Thank you for starting all these conversations. Just so important, each and every one of them. I was just reading the chapter titles. Um, I know I'm going to enjoy the... 14 of them, huh? all of them all are of masala. Them. Hai, no? <laughs> Total the <cha> masala. <laughs> But you know, my question or really, it's, it's more of a comment, is about the mental load that we're taking on as women, as yeah. girls. You mentioned your, you know, your colleagues. They're, they're going through PhDs, whether they want to or not, yeah. the academic line, just to get away. So, you know, you're making this a, a getaway plan, an escape plan when we're in the, in the corporate uh, boardroom, for example. You're making sure you're giving out the right wives, not the wrong wives. You're dressing. I mean, that mental load is just tremendous. Just to yeah. be able to make an impact and just to be able to get your way or prove a point or not prove a point, join the chai sota breaks or not, you know, it's, it's all a lot of planning and it's a lot of thinking, pressure. a lot of pressure in every single thing that we're doing. Yeah. When are we ever going to get out of that? I know there's no straight answer, I'm not able to articulate a question, but it's, it's certainly a comment on a lot of the things that we were talking about today, that yeah. women are dealing with everything else and also the mental load of dealing with those things. Yeah. So I don't know how to get out of that. And, and you know what? I think this is, this is the next 
frontier of conversations that will happen. Because one of the things when I'm concluding in the book, I say that we've been so trained to be Rambo at work because that's how it is, right? You've got to hustle for everything. I've hustled all my life and I've been very proud of it. But sometimes when I look back and saying, oh my God, there was way too much hustle for somebody who really didn't have to do that. Because now I'm seeing, you know, my own kids, I'm seeing other people, I'm seeing how, how we don't give ourselves a break. Somebody the other day was saying this and I guess now it's, this is what I say about social media and you know, there was a lot that's going on around how bad social media is. But I'm a huge fan because sometimes one post in the morning just gets me out, right? So one of the posts I read was of a woman who was sort of crumpled on her bed. So like, I'm just resting. <laughs> Full stop. I'm just resting. <laughs> and I know this feeling because the times I have felt guilt, like everybody else around in this room, what do you mean you're resting? <laughs> just get up, get on with it, get up, get on with it. There is just no stopping. And we as mums make our daughters do this. So I have a young five-year-old who looks at this book and she says, you've written this book because she can't read right now. So she said, okay. So I said, okay, let me show you this page. There's a page that says dedicated to Abir and Bani. Okay. She looks at me. But why is it not Bani and Abir? And she can't read. She only knows how to read her name. She knows her name is after the end. And so Abir and I, my elder one and I are looking at each other and saying, uh, okay, maybe because it's alphabetical. Okay. And then, then we conjure up another way and say, okay, now Abir came first to the world and she came second. She's still staring at us saying, this is not cutting with me. So then I say, okay, in my next book, I'm going to say Bani and Abir. She says, ah, that's a good idea. That's when she stopped. But I have not trained her to ask these questions. She doesn't know much about she the people because she still can't read. And so she doesn't have a sense of my feminism at all. Other than the fact that she can just ask these questions with such ease. It just comes to her, right? And these are the questions that are going to make us rethink this whole thing about pressure. Like another thing that my son said, which I never thought, you know, we went for a holiday and said, you haven't journaled at all. He's like, you know, it's nice to do it sometimes, but sometimes it's nice to be boring. I love being boring. <laughs> and I said, you're right, Abir, it's okay to be boring. Let's be boring, <laughs> you know. It's not something, I'm so busy trying to journal and get all these things going. He's like, it's nice to be boring. <laughs> oh. You're not boring at all, by the way. I know. <laughs> now this is book, I can tell you that. I'm going to tell you guys that. Uh, any more questions? Come in, come in, come in. We're just taking a couple of more. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, the lovely conversations about motherhood and uh, what tip would you like to give to the young career-oriented daughters who are about to get married and they're earning more than their partners. Oh, great. So this is the, going and to be, as I said, the financial freedom uh, girls. Yeah. And I'm a mother of two daughters and what, I mean, I keep thinking, yes, from your, I'm really inspired by your conversations, first of all. And I'm looking for an answer that, okay, what tip I should give to my daughter? Because I, yes, I am in that position right now. It's a great situation to be. Just tell your daughters one simple thing. Don't marry a guy who's uncomfortable with your money bag. Just not. It is a litmus test. And it's right in front of you. You should not even possibly go ahead with anything in life if a guy is uncomfortable with his wife earning. But, but you know what? There'll be guys who would be so comfortable, he's like, thank God, my bojh is gone, yaar. and I think those guys are really cool, yaar. come on, you know, they, I mean, we feel for them, right? Because they really didn't want to do this. Guilt trip should not be happening in a daughter, you know, like, I'm earning little more than that, you know. Yeah, yeah, shouldn't. Not as a mother, give a tip to the daughter. You should tell us there's no guilt. We're conditioned wrong, yeah? There's no guilt. Guilt cannot come by earning more money. Yeah. Money is a goal, not guilt at all. <laughs> We just have to find a way to not let that happen. So, and mums have to do it. She the people, people, person. Yeah. I think it comes back to that. Yes. It's all about that, isn't yeah. it? I think I have another question here and I'm, I, I don't know, where is my dear Natasha? You want us to stop it now? Okay, fine, all right. Okay, please go ahead. Hello. So you did mention about the role of mothers and mother-in-laws. So, and we as uh, probably mothers to youngsters, I have a almost 18 year old. Uh, she's all set to, you know, go into a college life soon. So, and she's not a person that, you know, is very handy on, you know, uh, kitchen work or something. She's happy just sitting on her own, lazing or studying or, you know, and, but she's focused on her career. So, but, and at one point of time, she tells me that, you know, I'm the only child, you know, and 
at a later stage when you guys probably need it, I need to be in a situation where I can earn that enough to support you. So, you know, uh, that I feel proud that the girl, you know, is saying that, my daughter is saying that, while I also say that, you know, you don't have to do it, it's your wish to, you know, if you wish to, but that's not your, you know, destiny to be like doing it, like, you know, the pressure that we all have felt or the men feel in the society to kind of support their parents or something. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the thing that, yes, she has that thought, and I think that comes from how we bring them up or, you know, how would you want to talk to that? That should the girls be, you know, responsibility towards their older, you know, parents at that certain age? Yeah, no, I'll keep my answer brief, but, you know, there's a, there's a decent amount of coverage in this book about the concept of pariah dhan, which is to say that the girl has to be given away. And it's actually driven by the fact that the parents are so busy sort of building their trousseaus and handing over their money and their share and saying, okay, now you can leave, right? I think that actually fundamentally will be changed by our coming generations because really they recognize that this is ridiculous. Why should the girl be given away? And why should be the boy kept in the house? Paraya dhan, my God. Yeah, it's dhan. called paraya dhan, right? Like it's a big deal. I mean, marriages are, this is the fundamental center of Indian marriages that you give away your daughter. And I think that change in daughters is a huge way and a huge step by which this will move ahead. You talked about her not being interested in kitchen, etc. There's a, there's a part in this book where I mentioned how I knew how to roll chapatis when I was in class 8. I could Excuse do them eyes shut. Roll chapatis? Yeah. You know how to roll chapatis? Yeah, because I was trained to do that because otherwise what will you learn when you, what will you know when you go to the other house? But you know, right? Uh, one second, sorry to interrupt you and because we have to also close this in a session. Yeah. I think you can do it all, but I think what you're pushing here towards is the, the sort of what is pushed down people's throats. Of course. Where the, where I the don't want, I do not want to do it. So my point is that at one point you were conditioned that you had to do this, right? Because the society had trained your mom like that or your mother-in-law like that, so she wouldn't expect you to come there and not know how to do anything but make Maggie. But I think that's changing, but it'll change at the heart of it, you know, and that's where I'll part this by saying, Women have to stop thinking that when they go somewhere else, they have to change their personality. Mm -hmm. If you're yourself, which is exactly how I am, and that's really been the winning thing for me in my, in my married household, I don't change. I am just as irritating, as annoying, as feminist, <laughs> with my in-laws, as I am with my parents. And if I, if I pretend to be this baby doll who I'm not, that's where I'm just changing the expectations. So be authentic. Absolutely. And have your values in uh, place. Please throw your tantrums so that everybody is normalizing the idea of that you are human. Right? Just be yeah. yourself. Exactly. I would even say don't change your name. Okay. All right, guys. I'm going to wrap this up over here. You, of course, have the opportunity to mingle with uh, Madam right here after this uh, conversation. I just want to thank all of you for having been here. I hope that you pick up the book, which you will. And, of course, uh, as we can see, she has plenty to say. And I'm very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs>